Joining me now is Professor William Happer of uh, Princeton University. Good to have you with us, Professor Happer. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Uh, you know, um, whether global warming is real or not, the fact is it's a phenomenon that has uh, entered the everyday lexicon. Everybody talks about it. And we're hearing it now again in the uh, context of extreme weather, specifically this year's warm winter. I mean, I was talking to a friend just today who is from North Dakota who said even they had a warm winter. And President Obama, I think in a speech the other day, was remarking on the 75 degree winter uh, temperatures and suggesting maybe this had something to do with global warming. Is there any relationship between this uh, warm winter that everybody's talking about and the phenomenon known as global warming? No, I don't think so, because if you look around the world, for example, it was an extremely cold winter in Alaska and in the uh, Pacific Northwest and of course in Europe, Russia and, uh, and most of Europe. So um, if you look at the global averages, very little has changed this year. Right. And isn't the same thing said about the uh, high incidence of, uh, of tornadoes that we've been having, that this too is being driven by fluctuations in temperature, and everyone's acutely aware of tornadoes, the destruction they're doing, it strikes people as off the charts. I mean, could you, is there any legitimacy to attributing that sort of phenomenon to uh, warming trends. I think if you look at the charts, it's not off the charts at all. You know, we have tornadoes uh, every year. Some years there are more, some years are less. This is well within the natural variability. Well, then, would you try to put into some context for us the issue of extreme weather? I mean, clearly it's something that people do talk about a lot. Up here in New York, you do have the sensation that most of the storms we get are just incredibly intense storms. But is there a relationship between extreme weather and, and global warming, or could the extreme weather be the consequence of something else that's going on? Well, first of all, I don't think there is extreme weather uh, from a historical point of view. If you look at the statistics of weather, there's nothing unusual about we, the weather we've had in the last uh, generation. There's certainly much more extreme weather in the 30s than uh, we've had uh, in the last 10 or 20 years now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But could it be, you know, the cause, could it be the result of things like, uh, you know, more like ocean currents, El Nino or La Nina, uh, that, you know, it, many people say, suggest is having something to do with variations in some of the weather we've been experiencing the last 10 years? Well, of course, but El Nino and La Nina were operating in 1700, too. So it's just that people are more aware of these long-range connections now than they were before. We didn't have the observational ability to know about these earlier. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the data that you've described in the article that'll be about you that'll be appearing in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. Um, the latest controversy seems to be over the warming trend of the past 10 years. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has predicted one range of warming. Could you tell us what exactly they predicted and what seems to have recorded based on the recorded data that we've uh, got? Well, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel has predicted a warming, which you can read about, and, and you can also measure the warming we've had in the last 10 years. There's been really no statistical warming that you can detect for either the ground-based data or for satellite data. And uh, that's way outside of uh, the predictions of the IPCC, which would have had uh, several tenths of a degree warming over that same period of time. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, what's at, at the center of this, of course, is the amount of carbon dioxide, CO2, that's in the atmosphere. And you argue in your piece that it's not really a pollutant per se and that it could even be beneficial. Try to explain that for us. Well, first of all, carbon dioxide is a completely natural gas. Each of us exhales carbon dioxide every time we take a breath. And uh, plants need carbon dioxide to live. You know, if we had a third of the carbon dioxide level we have now, plants would die. So we're not far from the lower limit in which plants can even live. And we're a very, very long way from the upper limit. 
Mm -hmm. We're kind of at the low end of the CO2 levels that we've experienced in geological history. Uh, one last thing I'd like to ask you about that you raise in the, in the article, and that is the, um, the computer models that are used to um, drive the arguments for global warming. Uh, could you explain to us a little bit the nature of these I mean, these are actually software programs that are inputted into commercials. If you outputted them, it would probably create a stack of papers about a foot high. This is a lot different from actually observing physical phenomena out in the real world, is it not? Very different. Yet the, the predictions of the computers have uh, not agreed very well at all with what's being observed. And that's not surprising. You know, it's a very, very difficult system. The climate is about as complicated a thing as people have ever tried to model. It's certainly more complicated in, in many ways than, say, modeling a nuclear weapon. Right. Right. Well, all right. Thank you, Professor Happer. The next time I see umbrellas strewn from one end of Fifth Avenue to the next, I'll keep in mind nothing new. Thanks a lot. Thank you.